Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let me begin briefly by introducing our panelists, um, Secretary Kendall, uh, Secretary of the Air Force, Senator Angus King of the great state of Maine, General Paul Nakasoni, who has two hats, uh, head of Cyber Command, and uh, uh, Director of the National uh, Security Agency, and uh, Mr. Horacio Rosensky, the um, President of, and CEO of Booz Allen Hamilton Incorporated. Um, I'm delighted to be um, leading such an esteemed panel, and I wanted to um, start our conversation today picking up um, at um, some of the topics that um, Abby Phillip covered so well in her panel this morning. And I wonder if we could pull up um, a graph from the Reagan um, Forum uh, survey that was released this week looking at national security topics and how Americans view them. So if you look at that survey, what you'll this is a survey about the threats that uh, Americans are concerned about in the next five years. It goes from 2018 to 2022, and you'll see that cyber attacks lead those concerns consistently and really far ahead of any other um, major national security threats. And so given that we're going to be on a panel talking about national security, I thought it would be a good place to start to look at um, these results and ask each of you to talk about um, how we talk about these issues. You know, so often I hear from readers and um, um, those who are interested in this topic that one reason that number is so high is that people don't really understand and how the nation is tackling them because of the sort of classification, the secrecy around these topics. And so my question to each of you is, what metric should the American public be using to assess the success of their nation's cybersecurity, um, given that they can see so little about it? And how are you trying to um, create a space where some more of this information is releasable so that they can have a better understanding of the work that you're doing? Would you like to start us off, Secretary Handel? Sure. Um, you threw me a little bit of a, a curveball with the, what the American public should be thinking about part of the question, because I was thinking about it more from my perspective and the metrics I would use. Um, when I look at the chart, it's fascinating, because the thing that I think may drive it more than anything else is the, 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 the recency of events that are in the foremind of, of the public. And if you look at the terrorist attack, uh, gradual decline over time. All it would take to dramatically change that curve is an attack tomorrow. Uh, cyber attacks are high because they're happening all the time, and there's a certain level of awareness of that. In my position as Secretary of the Air Force, I'm mostly concerned about the two at the bottom of the chart, but I guess if you added them together, you'd be right up there with cyber, and that's thermal nuclear war and, and conventional military conflict. So from my perspective, uh, and, and I don't have a good answer for you for the American people. I think. Uh, American people in general, I hate to say this, they don't look at metrics very much. They, they listen to stories about what's happening and they create impressions because of that, or they form impressions. The metrics I'm concerned about are the ones that give me a sense of how cyber secure my forces are, the forces in the Air Force and Space Force, um, how able we are if called upon to go do our job, and how convincing our deterrent capabilities are. But there's a large spectrum of things that influence that. I, I was thinking earlier about how my career entirely spans the uh, creation of the digital age and the level of concerns about cyber, and what we call cyberspace, becoming pervasive and ubiquitous. And, and it, it is, and you can't do anything in the security area without thinking about cyber considerations. Uh, most of what I worry about is the uh, traditional forces, effectively, right? We just rolled out the B-21 yesterday. Um, but all of those forces have to be secured, so that's my first priority. And metrics that help me understand that is my first priority. Then there are metrics associated with what kind of offensive capability I might have and how I might be able to use that. And much of that, of course, is, is obviously classified. So those are the sorts of things that I'm focused on. I would judge the metric from uh, Sherlock Holmes, hmm. the dog that didn't bark in the night. Hmm. The difficulty here is that success is something that doesn't happen, and it's hard to measure that. Yeah. Uh, but I think, for example, here's, a, here's a, uh, I think a perfect example. At the beginning of the Ukraine invasion, a lot of people assumed there was going to be a cyber attack. There were going to be major cyber attacks in Ukraine. There might well be a cyber attack on us. That was one of uh, Russia's uh, in their toolkit. I'm convinced that the reason that has not occurred is because of this guy, uh, that uh, we have literally deterred uh, Russia from uh, cyber attack because they know that we have the capacity uh, to make them pay a high price. 
So uh, I think you can say that over the past year, the fact that there, there certainly has been cyber, Russia, uh, cyber activity in, in Ukraine, some in, in Europe, there were a few recently in Poland uh, that we're concerned about, but by and large, that has been constrained, I think, uh, because of <clears throat> good policy here that has developed a cyber deterrent. Uh, on the other hand, the other piece of this that's so important is we have to rethink conflict. We all think of conflict between countries as army against army and navy against navy. In this situation, 85% of the target space is in the private sector. So we have to have an entirely different kind of thinking about how the interface between government and the private sector works in, in cybersecurity. Uh, because the government can't do it. We can't, we can't sit at every computer at a, at, at, you know, a Raytheon facility in Boston or, or Whole Foods in, in Texas, it's got to be at, on the local level. Cybersecurity starts at the individual desktop. General Nakasone can do everything right, but if somebody in, a, in an engineering firm that works for a major defense contractor hits on a phishing email, we can be in real trouble. And so this, uh, we can talk a little bit more about this, but the, to me, one of the keys to the, to the defense of this country is developing a relationship of trust, which frankly often doesn't come naturally, between the private sector, particularly critical infrastructure, and the, the, uh, the United States government, which has extraordinary capability, but we have to have that relationship so that we can see threats, define threats, see where, they're, uh, where they might go, and uh, combat them. So that, that, that would be... I'll go back to uh, the dog that didn't bark in the night. So far, you're keeping that dog quiet. Uh, yeah. So thank you, Senator. I, I think your point on deterrence is an important one. Um, today's the 3rd of December. One year ago, a Hunt Forward team landed in Kyiv. Ten people from the Cyber National Mission Force landed there, and the leader of that team called back, and she, she said, we're going to be here for a bit. And so for the next 74 days, this team grew from 10 to 39 people working in Kyiv, working with our partners to strengthen their defenses, to understand what's going on, and also provide a bit of reassurance. Presence matters in this space still. You know, this is a domain that everyone says, oh, you're gonna do it, you know, from afar. But when you put people forward, you know, this team from the Cyber National Mission Force, this Marine Major who is leading her team, this really stands as the example of Okay, there is a lot that has changed, but there's still some things that are foundationally sound here. So presence. And the next piece is, is persistence. So for what hasn't been talked about Ukraine, which you had asked uh, for us to comment on, is the work that forces like 16th Air Force did and U.S. Army Cyber Command and the Cyber National Mission Force to strengthen our networks. I talk about Kiev and I talk about you know, what we were doing hunt forward. All that came back to the Senator's point to inform the tradecraft, the malware, the ransomware things that we're seeing that's shared with the private sector. And suddenly you have an antidote that has not millions, but actually billions of endpoints that are taken care of. And then the last piece is, is partnerships. This is what has changed dramatically. We get to scale with the private sector. We get to scale with the private sector, but the private sector is also interested in what we do as well. Why is that? because we operate outside the United States. We understand the adversary. We have technical expertise. Uh, these are things that really have, I think, um, based on the Solarian Commission and so many other things, have kind of grown this partnership. I mean, it's not only the you know, DOD, it's DHS and CISA, it's the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Um, that's taught us a lot, and that's just one year old. So uh, I, I see the chart, and I certainly understand it, and I think a lot of that is driven by you know, perhaps not fully understanding, and I think to your point, perhaps more of the information that we can share is also a good thing. So good morning. Uh, I, uh, I'm not a warfighter, I'm not a policy maker, I'm, I'm here as an uh, industry person. Um, and, and the perch that I have of this is uh, because Booz Allen has, uh, at least we've been rated as having the largest work for cyber workforce in North America. And we have the privilege of working across all of the main verticals. We work in intelligence, we work in defense, we work in the protection of the DAGA, we work in the private sector. Uh, and I, I have to tell you, uh, in the last four or five years of the lifetime of this chart, uh, the level of sophistication that each one of those verticals has experienced is breathtaking. Um, uh, 
Maybe it was the target breach uh, that where the CEO got fired that got all of us CEOs worried about this uh, at a completely different level. But the level of investment, uh, the, the level of effort has greatly increased, and that is the good news. The challenge continues to be at the seams, at the intersections uh, of all of those um, elements, whether it's the cyber protection of weapons platforms, whether it is law enforcement, connectivity to the private sector, you name it. That's where, uh, while progress has happened, clearly, more uh, needs to be made. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, something that didn't used to happen five years ago that happens now is every time a Fortune 500 company goes to acquire a mid-sized company, uh, they're going to do a cyber due diligence. And they're going to be looking at their cyber program and trying to understand what level of risk they're onboarding uh, onto their uh, own networks. And every one of these due diligences comes back the same way. Um, underfunded, unsophisticated, lots of holes. And these mid-sized companies, uh, while they may not be as prominent, end up playing a critical role uh, in, in the supply chain, in the critical infrastructure, and in the attack surface of the nation. And so closing down these seams, making talent, investment, and information travel faster across them is, I think, the next step. I think you all hit on some key points, and I'd like to kind of use a real-world example that happened recently to have a, a discussion about the effectiveness of cybersecurity. I'll open with you, General Nakasone. We just had a midterm election um, where there were fears of cyber attacks, and I'd like to get a sense from you what, what your grade is in terms of how the nation did. There were concerns that China might try to meddle. Were there examples of that? Are there lessons that you saw going forward that, that you can share with us in terms of cybersecurity at, and elections? So this is our third election at uh, U.S. Cyber Command and the National Security Agency. It began in 1820 and now 22. Um, bottom line, a safe and secure election. Uh, but it's a safe and secure election because of a whole of government effort. It's, it's not just us. It's, it's the fact that the Federal Bureau of Investigation, CISA, state and local levels are all tuned into this. Uh, what should we think about it? Uh, first of all, from 18 to 22, we've seen the threat expand. So in 18, we, were, we called ourselves the Russia Small Group, but it expanded from Russia to other, other countries. The second thing is that we continue to see information operations, information operations done from throughout the world, outside the United States that we are tracking. The third thing is, is you know, it is interesting just to see the role of private sector and academia, and let me talk about academia for a second, that is, developed a level of expertise that really understands what's going on. And the last thing that I would say on this is the fact that what we have learned is that our recipe for success hasn't changed. We generate really good insights. We share intelligence and information with the FBI and CISA, and then we take action against adversaries that are going to try to do us harm. We've done that since 18. We're going to continue to do that in the future. Uh, very, very proud of the work that has been done. And I think that you know, if we've learned anything, it's more partners are better. And being able to get to a larger scale in terms of what we're being able to expose, what we're being able to share, what we understand, that's success. When you say safe and secure election, I want to make sure I'm understanding that correctly. Is it, are you defining it because of that cooperation that happened? Because you were able to thwart new threats? Can you give us a sense when, what, what, what safe and secure election as you define it looks like? So safe and secure election for, for us is the absence of interference, uh, interference in our elections. And so again, the responsibility to lead for that in the United States obviously is uh, DHS, CISA, and uh, FBI. We play a supporting role, uh, and that's what we do. Okay. I wanted to go to a topic that came up throughout our opening statements, and I imagine will come up through today in general, which is Ukraine. Um, as you all know, there were expectations um, at the early days of the war. Senator King made reference to it that there would be a series of, of cyber attacks on electricity and, and other infrastructure in Ukraine, and we didn't see that. Um, and I'm curious. Um, we saw it, but we thwarted it, right? I mean, they were trying. So they were trying. And, and so here's another interesting point. You asked, what's some other facts that I should uh, talk about that perhaps haven't been exposed? Uh, the past year, the National Security Agency has released 24 different cybersecurity advisories, unclassified, things like last January. This is what to expect in terms of Russian attacks. That's released publicly. And so you say, hey, that sounds a little different. Yeah, it's tremendously different because we operate in a space to the senator's point where Almost 90% of the critical infrastructure is controlled by the private sector. That's how we communicate our message. Well, I want to come back to that, and then we'll go to Ukraine. But to Secretary Kendall's point, 
the, the idea of sort of the story that the American public should know. You mentioned these reports, but my, my sense is in talking to readers and listening to readers is that they don't quite understand the story. So how does that thread those reports that you referenced to to the story that you think they should know about, about cybersecurity, how they should be thinking about it? Bring it me? Yeah. Um, I think, first of all, they should understand that we can provide reasonable levels of protection against cyber attack if we make the efforts to do so. I think Senator King and his work with the Solarium Commission was really uh, very, very professional and really laid out a number of the things that we need to do across the, uh, the spectrum of things we need to do, not just in the military. And I think from my point of view uh, for military systems, if we pay uh, attention to them and if we put the resources into them, we can be reasonably cyber secure, but we have to do that. You have to, you have to accept that overhead, if you will, uh, to provide that feature. But the attacks will continue to evolve. They're gonna get more sophisticated over time as we build better defenses. And one of the hard things about metrics that came up earlier is you, there are always unknown unknowns that you have to deal with. Uh, so you can have a pretty good sense of what your posture is. W one observation is that over the last few decades, our ability to secure against cyber attacks has improved pretty dramatically. Uh, Richard Clark wrote a book a couple of years ago, talked about this, and building in resilience. You're never going to be perfect, but you can be highly resilient, and you can be at a point where, even if you get an unexpected attack, you can recover. Uh, so the, the enemy, if you will, and whatever mode it's in, is buying time, but they're not really destroying you or defeating you. So it's, it's, we've moved into a different, I think, era, and I think General Nakasone should talk about that, and maybe uh, our, the other panelists. So we're getting better at this. Uh, I don't know that I would say the advantage was entirely on the defensive side at this point in time, uh, but it's more so than it was at the beginning of the era of cybersecurity and, and, and cyberspace activities. So when a country like Russia, and I think this is a good example, tries to mount an attack in Ukraine, given some preparation, given some effort put into it, you may not be able to entirely defeat that attack, but you can blunt a lot of the impact of it. And there's, there's an important point to make that when we're, we're talking about, we're using the term cyber attack. And there are really two pieces. One is denial of service, bringing down the electric grid, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. The other is disinformation. Yes. And uh, Brad Smith touched on this. Disinformation is the, in, in, in the long run, may be the more serious problem, particularly for a democracy with the First Amendment. It's a very tricky thing. I don't want the government restricting information. Um, ultimately, and we, we thought a lot about this on the Solarium Commission, ultimately it really rests on education. Our citizens have to become better consumers of information and not believe the email that says, you'll never believe this. <laughs> you know, Obama put all the aircraft carriers in Norfolk so they could be bombed. And what, I mean, I, I actually saw that email. Uh, and we can't, in, in, with the First Amendment, we can't restrict it. And what we saw, I, I also serve on the Intelligence Committee during our study of the 2016 election. The Russians didn't invent the divisions in our society, but they'd take cracks and turn them into Grand Canyons. That was what they were, they were, they were, you know, pitting citizens, Americans against Muslims and all those kinds of things. And that's a very difficult thing to cope with from a governmental point of view. Our, we have to be uh, more discerning in terms of, of information. And I think the, the reality is we had a thousand years to figure out the printed word, to figure out you know what are the standards, editors, fact checkers, all those kinds of things. The digital age is 20 years old, 25, 30 years old, and we haven't developed the, we all are applying the same standards. If it's in the printed word, it must be true. You know, they're fact checkers and those kinds of things. And now somebody used, you know, Times New Roman font in their basement, and we think there's some, you know, we apply the same kind of uh, instant credibility, and we have to get much better at that. It has to start in the early grades with kids. I call it digital literacy. Mm -hmm. So they can discern when they're being misled, when they're being manipulated. Uh, but I, again, I think it's very important to, th to think of cyber as involving really two separate pieces. And uh, the mechanical part, the, 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 the cyber attack is certainly important. And General Nakasone was being too modest. In 2018, they were very active in, in, in dealing with uh, the, what the Russians were trying to do in our elections in terms of, of a, 
defend forward. And that got the Russians' attention. And I actually, I honestly, as I said before, believe that, that a big part of the reason we haven't had the level of attacks we might have expected is the old, you know, peace through strength, deterrence. Uh, and the fact that the, the Russians and others realize that we have the capability to uh, impose costs. You talked about education. I think one area that we learn about technology in particular is often in wartime. And, and Ukraine has been a, um, a, a test bed for, you, for Russian cyber attacks. And so we're watching in real time, I think, some of those attempts. And I, I wonder if you could help us understand a little bit more about what we've seen, what we haven't seen. I, I know that there's been a lot of efforts by the Ukrainians themselves to um, bolster their defenses. How much do you think of what we're seeing is because Russia is choosing not to be more aggressive in a bid to collect data from those, those open systems? Um, how much coordination are we seeing um, between their conventional and cyber attacks on infrastructure? I'd, I'd like to open it to all of you. And I'd love to hear it also from the, from the private sector perspective in terms of what you're seeing. So if I might begin, so we've seen the Russians conduct a number of destructive attacks within Ukraine. We've seen also them take down the, the satellite communications within the country that impacted outside of Ukraine as well. Uh, we continue to see information operations. Uh, give a lot of credit to the Ukrainians, a, a high degree of resilience. You know, also, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, that the Russians had planned for a commercial satellite company coming into Ukraine and providing that type of support, mm -hmm. which gets to the point of the private sector and the role of you know, the private sector in being able to develop a, a, a level of resilience. But you know, again, this, this is uh, also an adversary that uh, this, is, this is not through, and, and we remain very, very vigilant. And so we take a look every single day to ensure that, you know, that we are engaged with our adversaries to understand what they're doing. Do you see a coordination happening on the Russian side between their conventional attacks and, and their, their, their cyber attacks? And I'm not referring to the information one, but the, the, the offensive one, if you will. So I think if, if you were to talk to the private sector, they, they would certainly show the, you know, the, the instruments of, uh, of this type of coordinated of, of efforts. I mean, this is, this is an adversary that truly understands it, that has done this before in other conflict zones. Uh, but again, you know, the, the capability and capacity is one thing. The, out, the output and effects is another. Uh, generally speaking, military systems are designed with some degree of hardening. Uh, they use encryption a lot more, for example. Um, and, there are, and weapons designers are aware of cyber threats. So it's harder to go after those targets inherently. What the Russians have traditionally done, if you go back to Georgia, uh, operation against Estonia earlier, uh, and certainly in this campaign, is they use uh, disinformation, the thing that Senator King talked about. They, they try very hard to influence um, uh, opinions, essentially. And when you think about it, Russia is run by a former KGB officer. And when you contrast that with China, uh, which is a much more economic focused, the threat from Russia tends to be in the disinformation side and trying to influence politically. The threat from China tends to be, and these are great overgeneralizations, uh, in intellectual property theft for a variety of reasons, espionage plus economic reasons. So you've got different sets of threats there. There's another category, which is one I worry about more, which is associated with weapons. And penetrating a weapon system is inherently a much harder thing to do. And the Russians have not, as far as I know, had much success with that. Mr. Rosansky. No, I think I agree with everything that's being said. The, the big challenge here has been that, that it's been both conventional and non-kinetic at the same time. Uh, their information operations uh, efforts are extensive, beginning with inside their own country to shore up support for a war they're losing. Uh, and in the neighboring countries and, and extending beyond. I think if you talk if you about a disinformation campaign, the disinformation campaign within Russia exactly. yeah. is extraordinary. Exactly. The propaganda, basically. Uh, and then as it relates to American companies, uh, I think we, we have to thank uh, NSA and CISA and the law enforcement uh, agencies for putting forth a lot of information, declassifying things very quickly, making things clear to everybody about what was going to happen and allow American companies, especially the American companies that took a strong stand by exiting uh, Russia and, and creating uh, additional economic difficulties there uh, to be protected from what uh, could have come and could have been much more catastrophic than it was. I want to pick up on something that you said and, um, and has come up in the panel a lot. We, we, you've, you've described a Russia that's been aggressive in trying to, and in some cases successfully launching cyber campaigns, either in dis disinformation or in Ukraine. 
So do you, how concerned are you that you, we could see a Moscow using um, cyber warfare, maybe um, its internal um, criminal cyber outfits to harm uh, in the West during the winter and make support for uh, Ukraine harder, particularly in, um, and across Europe? Uh, is that a worry that you have that we could see those kinds of attacks that the limitations of what's happening in Ukraine manifest that they instead go after Ukraine's allies in a bid to, to break support. Is that something you're watching? Are there trends that suggest There's that? no question that that's part of Putin's strategy sure. is to undermine the, unification, the, the unity in the West. We're going to see a lot of uh, uh, disinformation or uh, information kind of campaigns, particularly in Europe. And here, we saw some of it here going into this campaign, into this midterm election. Uh, you know, Putin, Putin wins if, if support deteriorates. And uh, there's no question that that's going to be uh, this winter as times are tough. And by the way, times are going to be very tough in Europe. I, I get a daily uh, energy price brief. Uh, and and uh, as of this morning, the price of natural gas at Henry Hub is about, the US natural gas price is about $7 a million BTU. It's $44 in Europe. Think I had, I mean, that's, it's not marginally higher, it's dramatically higher. And that's going to be a ripe area for exploitation by, by the Russians, there's no question. Hmm. Yeah, to build on that, um, so I think, as Senator King said, Russia's number one strategic goal is to undermine NATO support for Ukraine going into the winter um, because things are going to stall and, and that's their opportunity. The, uh, I was just in uh, Germany and the UK visiting with the 600 Buzalon people that are, are supporting all of these missions over there. And when you got into conversations with our staff, their number one concern is how am I going to pay my heating bill this winter? Uh, I don't have a thousand extra dollars to, to spend heating my house. Uh, and, and so then this is where uh, Russia probably is already or will run information operations in Germany, in Italy, in all of the places where they may sense weakness. Uh, and uh, you hope that NATO as a, as a completed entity uh, with the support of NSA and Cyber Command will actually have the right defenses. Hmm. You know, one thing we hear frequently is that um, China and other countries are watching what's happening in Ukraine, both conventionally and from a cyber perspective, to see what they can learn in their own um, goals. And I'd, Secretary Kendra, I'd love to start with you because um, you're, you're looking at this from a warfighter perspective. What do you see um, lessons that China could be potentially taking away from the war in Ukraine that potentially has applicability to Taiwan? What are the trends that you're seeing? I get that question quite a bit, actually. Um, and we all, we're all looking at this very carefully, and we're thinking about what we're learning from it, and we're also thinking about what others are, are likely to learn from it. The, the things I would like uh, China in particular to learn from, the, from this war are, first of all, that the economic consequences of uh, doing an aggressive act may be much more severe than you, you, would, you would prefer, that um, your military uh, may not be quite accurate when they're telling you how good they are. Um, you know, I think uh, President Putin was, was, was very, I won't say deceive may be the right word, but he certainly overestimated dramatically the capabilities of his own military. Including um, their cyber, cyber capabilities? In, including cyber capabilities. And the, the, other, the other thing is that the short war you anticipate may not be the war you get. Now, those may not be the lessons that are being learned. Those are the ones I'd prefer to be learned. The lessons that may be being learned are more about, okay, if we're going to go do an act of aggression, we have to do it in a way which is much more decisive. Uh, and learn from the Russians that way. So I'm, I'm, you know, that, that is another thing you can get from this. Um, one thing I would hope also in general is that there are a lot of unknowns associated with conflict, whether it's in the cyber world or in the conventional world or the, the more, more conventional world. Cyber is becoming conventional. The, the, um, uh, the efficacy of the things you might want to do may, may sound pretty good. You might even have experimented with them a little bit, but when you actually put them into practice, you may find that they don't work as well as you anticipated. Yeah. And the Russians are still trying a lot of things, I think, and they're having very limited success with some of the things they're trying. Uh, which is encouraging. So that, that's where I would uh, hope would be happening. Mm. Mr. Rosensky, I know that Booz Allen has looked at this and studied this issue. I'm curious from a private sector perspective, what are you seeing in terms of how China's thinking um, going forward in terms of its cyber, secure, cyber attack capability? So, you know, China is the pacing challenge for the United States, and, and it's a technology challenge, and it's a talent challenge almost more than anything else. 
uh, and it's not an in the future, it's something that is happening now, from the theft of intellectual property to their cyber attacks, uh, to their territorial ambitions. Um, our, our cyber team uh, did an extensive study, all open source, uh, on, on how China goes about cyber, and there's a couple of salient things that I think are, are pretty important to know. One is that while the United States is still ahead technologically and in terms of capability, uh, they're much more unrestrained. Uh, they don't seem to care about getting caught. And that gives them the ability to do certain things that, that uh, the Western world will not do. Uh, the, the second point is that if you want to know what China is going to do on cyberspace, it is almost entirely aligned to their rhetoric. Uh, so every time they complain about something in the world stage, it is either preceded by or followed by uh, a cyber attack. And the third thing is that uh, while they're brash, they're also capable and patient. Uh, there's a really good uh, example that, that our team uh, collected in the study about how uh, after Taiwan uh, began an, a discussion of independence in 2017, I think it was, uh, they went after the energy industry. And the attribution is clear and the capabilities were pervasive, and uh, it was pretty successful at almost hijacking a critical industry for a period of time just to make it clear that if you get out of line, uh, cyber is going to be a tool that they're going to use. So I think every one of us needs to be, especially people who are threat officers or CISOs in the private sector, need to be very much aware of what the rhetoric is, how it applies to their agency, and uh, how to defend against it. I I think, I think we have a lot to learn from, from Ukraine, tactically, strategically, but also historically. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, the Ukraine situation is, is an affirmation of Mark Twain's famous observation that history doesn't always repeat itself, but it usually rhymes. <laughs> and I, I actually approved a letter this week from, to constituents. I get constituents' letters who say, why are we doing this? We have a lot of problems here. Use the money for home heating oil. Forget about, you. why are we doing this Ukraine business? Billions of dollars. My answer, my first line of my answer literally said, Google Sudetenland in 1938 <laughs> and Rhineland 1936. And that's what we're seeing. And I think that's one of the learnings of this is uh, despots tend to be expansionist. And, and you mentioned, uh, you know, Maya Angelou says, if somebody tells you who they are, you should believe them. Putin has been telling us for 20 years he wants to reestablish the Soviet Union. And Ukraine is where he started. I have no doubt that if they had swept into Kiev in a week and, and decapitated the government and essentially taken over Ukraine, that we would now be seeing uh, probes into the Baltics. Uh, I mean, that, so that's what's so important, I think, about what, what we're doing now, because history tells us that if you don't confront this kind of activity, it inevitably, inevitably will, will get worse and worse. If Hitler had been stopped in 1936 in, in the Rhineland, 55 million lives could have been saved. And people come to, the other question I get from my constituents is, why are we spending so much money on defense? The answer is the only thing more expensive than establishing a credible deterrent is a war. And that's really what we're trying to talk about here. But I think Ukraine is being instructive on a lot of levels, on what you're learning on, on, the, on the ground. But also, the, this is an important moment in world history uh, that we've basically said, no, uh, uh, taking over another country on your border by force is not acceptable. Mm. I want to ask one other thing on China to you, General Nakasone. We've seen protests recently um, in China over COVID restrictions, but there have been some concerns that um, because of some of the um, efforts by the Chinese uh, censorship um, uh, and propagandists that we haven't been able to actually hear the voice of protesters. At the same time, on Twitter, we've seen um, that they, the new CEO has decided to lay off the entire content moderation teams. Is it a national security concern when a private social media company can suddenly collapse its content moderation teams and in doing so, create space for authoritarian states like China to control the online discourse in their favor? So I'll leave that, Nancy, to the, the policy folks to, to work that out. Here's what I would say. Um, the whole discussion on influence today is, is a critical discussion because our role in influence operations outside the United States is to expose it. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things that was at the panel this morning is this decision by our government to release a lot of information 
last year about Russia Ukraine. And that was Which you didn't know, come naturally to you guys. But was done very well, I yes, think. Yes, it right, was. Senator, and I think that you know what we have learned, why was that information released? Really for three reasons. One, build a coalition, two, disrupt an adversary, and three, enable a partner. And so if you're Chinese senior leadership, perhaps that's one of the things that you're most concerned about is what you've seen in terms of that effect that, that we've been able to have in, in this type of uh, uh, release of information. Could you see a scenario, though, where it could play itself out domestically, where you have people sort of um, hijacking hashtag campaigns in an effort to, to flood out discourse? Is that something you're looking at as a way of um, silencing protesters even domestically? So again, outside the United States, that's where we operate. That's where our authorities are. And certainly if that's occurring, then we're going to, you know, given the direction of the, uh, the president, the secretary of defense, take actions. I think one of the most serious problems of this moment is the power of a despot to control their population. Yes. It's Absolutely. almost impossible to conceive of a popular revolution that would overthrow the Communist Party in China, even if there was hugely widespread discontent. Iran, the same way. Russia, the same way. The, the ubiquitous surveillance, uh, torture, secret police, the, the, the technology of, of repression is so powerful today that you, it, it's, it's very difficult to imagine a popular uh, human rights kind of thing that would actually be successful. Uh, it just, it, it, it's just, it's almost inconceivable in, in those countries. And that's, that's, a, that's a modern reality. We thought in the, in the 80s and 90s that, that the internet and fax machines were gonna sort of, you know, the Arab Spring, you know, information was gonna liberate people. But now we're back to George Orwell where technology is actually being used more in terms of repression around the world. And that's, that's a, a fundamental strategic reality that I think is very difficult to, to cope with. Let me piggyback on that a little bit. I, I couldn't agree more with Senator King that I am, I am terrified of what a regime can do once it gains control of information with modern tools. That uh, facial recognition, uh, monitoring where everybody goes on their phones, who they talk to, what they say, uh, what associations they have. The tools are just unbelievable for control of a population of society once you get them into your hands. And how to get them out and how to organize any resistance in an environment like that, I, I have no idea how you do it. But there is another aspect of this, and I think it's that we're, we're still in a free society wrestling with how to deal with this new technology. And, I, and analogies you can make are use of propaganda, once upon a time print propaganda, Later, the error, again, Senator King talked about with the Nazis, use of radio very effectively to influence population. And that's something that's continued. And then later, television, right? So now we've got this new way to, everybody can self-publish. Everybody has almost infinite capacity to put information out there, whether it's true or false and for any purpose. So we're gonna have to figure this out. And as long, while we're a free society, I think we can do that. Uh, but we're gonna have to figure out what the rules of the road are and we're gonna have to figure out how we're gonna enforce them without taking away people's freedom. Um, one of the things I think we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to become much more sophisticated consumers. And if you look at earlier uh, attempts to influence human beings through advertisement, commercial in particular, or politically, you know, they were kind of crude and people became better at understanding um, you know, what, what was real and what wasn't. And, you know, we're all less, I think, susceptible to advertisements than we might have been once upon a time. A lot of us are still very susceptible to political influence by people we trust. And we're going to have to work on that. I think we have to work on that as a society. Uh, or we could go down a road that, that once we get down it, we get into a position where it's going to be very, very hard to recover. Mm. So to build on Secretary Kendall's point, uh, just for context, it took about 100 years from the invention of the telephone until telemarketers started ruining dinner. <laughs> took 20 years from the first email to the first spam email. Took five years from the creation of Facebook to the first pedophile uh, being uh, tried for using social media. Uh, these cycles to where a new technology uh, has all a, a really good run before malicious uh, things happen to it uh, is really shortening. And so this is an area where private and public sector, we need to learn to collaborate much better in order to try and get in front of all of those issues. Because when we talk about AI, we talk about 5G, we talk about quantum, uh, the promise is extraordinary. 
and some of the challenges in terms of attack surfaces and so forth are also there and are also real. And we need to get to those issues much faster than we have in the past. But it's somewhat beyond the scope of this discussion because we're all talking about cyber. I'm very worried about other technology-based uh, attacks, electronic warfare. Mm -hmm. All of these fancy weapons we have depend upon GPS. What happens when GPS is knocked, is, is gone? Uh, you know, a simple example, but uh, electronic warfare, hypersonics, directed energy, uh, the history of conflict is often who sees the advantage of technology first. I just read a wonderful article this morning about Genghis Khan was able to conquer the world because of the stirrup. That's right. That was the new technology in 1207 that enabled his archers to, to ride and shoot at the same time. And that technology, and then you flash forward to you know, the Battle of Agincourt and the longbow radar in World War II. We've gotta be thinking broader. I mean, cyber is clearly the, a, an important piece of battle space, but, but so is electronic warfare. And it, it relates back to cyber because we're so cyber dependent. The good news is we're the most wired society in the history of the world. The bad news is we're the most vulnerable society in the history of the world because of that. So I just, I, I don't, in you know, 10 minutes, don't want to get into electronic warfare, but it's, it's, it's something, we, we got to think of this as a broader sort of technological based challenge. I'll, I'll piggyback on that also. I've got Chief Brown here from the Air Force, and I think Chief Saltzman I saw earlier from the Space Force, uh, and I saw coming up Bird earlier this morning. Uh, it's not just technology, it's how you use it. It's how you integrate technology into operational concepts and employ them together. And the changes that Senator King talked about are very real. One that's very apparent in Ukraine, and it was apparent earlier in Nagorno-Karabakh, is the use of un un unmanned systems of autonomy and how much that's changing future battlefields. So we have got to get, we've got to understand these technologies and then we've got to understand the, the, the optimum military application of them and get there first. Mm. We're in a race there just as much as we are for cyber. We have just a couple of minutes I'm gonna, before we take questions. I want to come closer to home and pick up on something, Mr. Rosensky, that you said earlier about how there's good cooperation happening, but at the seams there's areas of improvement. And I think what you're really talking about is structure. And right now we're having uh, an ongoing discussion about the structure of cyber command and NSA. General Nakasone, I understand that uh, General Dunford has provided his report and his recommendations in which he decided, didn't decide <laughs> definitively whether the two agencies should be split. What is the future of those two organizations? Would you support a split? And if so, when would it happen? So Nancy, at the end of the day, this is a policy decision that will be made. Uh, anything decision, we're, we're gonna support this. But what, what's my reason? Why is the dual hat so important for, I think, the nation? It gives us three things. First of all, it gives us speed, it gives us agility and it gives us unity of action in a domain that moves so rapidly. As, as Horacio was saying here, this is, this is not years and, and, uh, and decades. This is you know, you know, days and weeks many times. And so being able to rapidly adjust to election security or ransomware or Russia, Ukraine is enabled by a command that is world class in signals intelligence and also in cyber. This is the future of, of what we're seeing today. This is the changing nature of conflict. Right, my past two decades, I spent time going into and out of different countries where I was able to put my boots on the ground, where I was able to put in ground sensors, where I was able to you know, do all of the things that we needed to do and fly all the airborne intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance we wanted to over that country. We're not doing that today. But yet, we're having tremendous success against our adversary. That's because we can operate with speed, agility, unity of effort in cyber and in signals intelligence. I'll, I'll summarize what he just said. The last thing we need is two new silos. NSA and CyberCom are so complementary, and if, they were, if it were separated in my view, and I've, I've sort of modified my view on this over the years, it, it would be, uh, I think we'd lose a lot. Uh, I, I put an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act to make this, this position an eight-year position like the Chief of Naval uh, Reactors uh, this guy wasn't crazy about it. He, he just bowed his head <laughs> down just so you know when he said that. Uh, but what he doesn't know, it, it, it didn't make it into the, into the committee bill, but what you don't know is that we're now getting it into the final bill, and it's, it's going to be life without parole. <laughs> uh, I'll pass it on to my wife. <laughs> well, I, I'd be then remiss to not ask you, General Nakasone, you've been in the job for five years. It'll be six in May. 
Do you uh, anticipate having the sixth anniversary there? What do you think about your future? It's an un unusual to see someone in uniform in the same position so long. I'm just curious how you're thinking about your future, if you wanted to make any announcements today re related to that. <laughs> Nancy, I serve with the pleasure of the Secretary of Defense and the President. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, this is a great opportunity. We've gotten some wonderful questions from the audience, and so I'm going to go ahead and put those um, to you, and I'll leave it to you gentlemen to decide who wants to take these questions, because um, they have not specified um, who they I'll go to. I'll take the easy one. Okay, great. Um, you tell me if this is an easy I, th I think they're all hard, though. Um, what are the combat domains that are most efficient in terms of the integration of cyber capabilities? Could you say I'm that sorry. again? I'm so sorry. What are the combat domains that are the most deficient in terms of the integration of cyber capabilities? Cyber is integrated in everything. Uh, you can't fight in any domain. You could argue perhaps under sea maybe, but um, the, the, we, we take it as a given now that cyber considerations have to go into anything we build. And any war fighting concept that we, that we think about, we have to think about cyber operations as part of it. Uh, one thing that I think is true in, when you talk about de both deterrence and you talk about actual warfare is that the integration of cyber with operations really amplifies the strength of both. And you have to do them together. If you try to do either one independently, you're probably not going to be successful. Um, I mentioned cybersecurity earlier and the importance of that. You can't design anything without hardening it against cyber attack. You also have to think about all the things you depend upon. Some of you in the room probably are familiar with the uh, operational imperatives that we've been using in the Department of the Air Force for the last year or so to kind of organize our work and, and define the capabilities that we need. One of them was essentially about cybersecurity. It was about investigating all the things we depend upon to go to war. That's our personnel system, our medical system, our transportation system, our logistics system. A lot of these things are connected to the commercial internet and they're part of the national infrastructure. So you have to think about all those things, as well as all the weapon systems you build and everything they're connected to for any function that they happen to have, including, for example, maintenance. Uh, so it's, it's a ubiquitous problem. It cuts across everything. And there's no part of warfare that I can imagine where the use of cyber can't potentially enhance the other things or strengthen the other things you're trying to do and vice versa. Mm. So you have to think about them together. It, it, it's, it's inherent now in everything that we're doing. And that's a transformation in the last 20 years, so I would say. So I think we're relearning um, after two decades of, uh, you know, violent extremist organizations and counterterrorism, the importance of encryption. I mean, I mean this is a, a fundamental thing that we do at the National Security Agency. No one makes code or breaks code better than our agency in the world. And we're learning that again in terms of our service. Our most sensitive communications, our most lethal weapons platforms have to be enabled by world-class encryption. And that's, I think, really to the, the point that all the service secretaries have been very, very supportive. Let me, I would uh, make your, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna add one thing. Secretary Austin, I think, will talk about integrated deterrence. Um, and it's kind of the heart of our strategy. So it extends to our partners, too. Uh, we, we, we will fight as a, as a coalition, if you will, or as an alliance in any operation I can think we would do. The United States will not fight alone. So we have to have our partners integrated in this too, and they have to be cyber secure enough to be able to operate with us. Mm. So it extends beyond, beyond just our own capabilities and our, even, and our connection to, uh, to, you know, to our support functions. I was gonna make the point that uh, in some ways we have to stop thinking about cyber as its own thing. Yeah. Uh, and that whether that's in the warfighting domain or as a technology, said, uh, if you think about it, cyber and AI are on a collision course. Uh, they, they'll become one and the same uh, if they haven't already. We can't fight in space without cyber and AI at the same time because the lag times are just too significant. Uh, if you think about uh, quantum, uh, post-quantum encryption is going to revolutionize a lot of things and General Nagosoni knows more about this than, than anybody. Uh, and even when you really start developing new systems, uh, right, I mean, the best time to put an alarm system in your house is when your house is getting built. The SecOps, the best time to actually build a secure system is to build it when you're coding the first time around. And so we really have to continuously think about cyber as an integrated element of everything we do. It's such a good point, and, and in addition to what Secretary Kendall said about working with other countries, because I think what we're seeing in private sector and even across governments is great variance in terms of how they think about that. We just saw, for example, the attack in Australia that some people believe was because they haven't given these kinds of issues the, the weight of it that you all are talking about doing as well. And so I wonder how you do that cooperation, how you do that integration when the spectrum of sort of engagement on this, on this topic is so varied. 
the, the, you made the, you use the term cooperation, and that we really haven't touched on that. This is an international issue. Right. One of the most important initiatives of the administration uh, was the creation of a of a cyber bureau in the st State Department. Uh, the head of it is an amazing guy named Nate Fick, from Maine, by the way. Uh, uh, but he has other qualifications. Uh, but but the point is, this is a uh, all the countries have an interest in this. And I've always felt, for example, sanctions are more effective if they're multilateral than if they're unilateral. I want, I want a cyber actor not be able to go to Monte Carlo or Paris as well as Miami or New York. And also setting of standards internationally is something that is, is terribly important. The Chinese have been very aggressive on these standard setting bodies that are sort of technical and, and, and boring and we have been, not been participating actively. This new bureau uh, at the Department of State, and, and I'm hoping that part of the National Defense Act will be something called the Cyber Diplomacy Act, which will establish this office in the State Department on an ongoing basis, not just one administration, uh, because I think this is so important. This, 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 is a, this is not only our problem, it's everybody's problem. Mm -hmm. You extend that even further, the CHIPS Act, which we just passed, um, is partly about secure microelectronics. Cybersecurity starts with the basic devices that you have to have. And so access to reliable microelectronics, which we're confident of the content, is a part of this equation also. Mm. I want to end with um, a question about Ukraine, because I think that is obviously the, the uh, dominant issue of um, today. Um, and this comes from a member of our audience who asks, how have changes in Russia's cyber attacks and the war in Ukraine updated your views on how to ensure the resilience of US allies' critical infrastructure in a protracted, on, in a protracted conflict? What, is it, what have we learned that, that teaches us about protecting not only infrastructure, but um, uh, infrastructure under attack in this kind of warfare? I begin with the public sector. As I mentioned earlier, this is, this is how we get to scale. This is how we are able to shine a light on really bad tradecraft behavior, malware, ransomware, et cetera, is by sharing it with the public sector. This is, this is dramatically different, and I you think mean that- the, You mean the private sector? The private sector, yeah. correct, I'm sorry. And, and this really is, the, this is the, the piece that has changed so much in terms of where we can go in the future. And are you confident that private sector can, can protect its own inf infrastructure enough to hold that information and not have second and third order effects? Um, so, so this is the give and get, right? This is the, the working with government that has insights about what our adversaries are doing and also being able to provide the information that they're seeing as well. Hmm. One of our Solarium proposals was something called the Joint Collaborative Environment. Mm -hmm. We set up a, a structure where you could have the federal agencies, FBI, NSA, Cybercom, CISA, DHS, and the private sector as a place to come together, a kind of safe forum uh, on these issues. And, and we're not quite there yet, but I think that's, that's an important next step in terms of our setting up our structure. I, I ought to mention CISA and Jen Easterly, uh, and also Chris English, the National yeah. Cyber Director, uh, and Newberger at the National Security Council. That's the, that triumvirate is the, is the is, is really an extraordinary group of people. And CISA has done a great job, and I saw it. In 2016, we had secretaries of state. They didn't want anything to do with CISA. They were, you know, we're okay, leave us alone. And Chris Krebs developed, and remember I, I used the word trust, developed a relationship of trust with the secretaries of state around election security. And now CISA's doing the same thing with the private sector where they've got a program called, I love it, it's called Shields Up helping the private sector to, to deal with these kinds of issues. So that's where I think, as I said at the very beginning, we're looking at new kinds of combinations of, of uh, relationships that are, that are gonna be critical if we're gonna be able to, to navigate this problem. I wanna go back to what General Malkasoni said earlier a little bit. Uh, one of the things that's been critical in Ukraine is the ability to flow information to the Ukrainians. Their force has been much more successful because of that. I can't go into many details here about this, but the foresight General Nakasone and his team had and their ability to be agile and adaptive and to take advantage of the private sector have been all the difference in the world. And we, there's an enormous amount to learn from that. And, and we could do much better, I think, even going forward with our partners if we're, if we're ready to use some of those tools. Well, you know, we began this discussion with, with um, a survey about people wanting to understand cybersecurity more, their concerns about it, and ways that we could talk about it in a more forthright way. And I hope that this panel has gone um, towards that. And I just want to ask the audience to join me in thanking everyone for such an engaging conversation. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks.